We're going to talk about the hatred for Jesus and try to understand uh, why there would be such great hatred for Jesus on earth, because all he did was good. Uh, obviously, he reflected, he was the reflection of the Father. And uh, obviously, if they hated Jesus that bad, they hate God that way. And uh, that kind of brings you to a thought. If, if people hate Paul or hate the message of Paul, they hate Jesus, hate God. And this, the situation is you got Jesus who is on earth and it's God was in the flesh, uh, manifest in his son and the great hatred for him. So let's, let's just kind of go through some things and well, nothing that you haven't read before right now, but in Acts chapter two, Peter stood before Israel and, and what he's doing is giving them a, a second chance. Well, when I say second chance, a, a first chance after they killed him, but a second chance in the sense that they rejected the, the Messiah, the Holy One. And he says in verse 22, Acts 2, 22, you men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth. And of course, that starts the whole thing right there. Nazareth, they didn't hate, they hated Nazareth. A man approved to God among you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which that's what Jews require. Approved of God by among you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourself also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. That Matthew 16, 21, he says, from that time forth, he began to show. And of course, it's all in the prophets and in the, in the Psalms and whatever about him. But the determinate counsel. <clears throat> and it's not when Jesus is betrayed and then put on the cross. That is not something that was like, God, what's happening? I mean, God knew all this was going on. He done has preparation for it and saw before the foundation of the world what he would do with it. But he says, uh, him being delivered by the term counsel for knowledge of God, you, Israel, I mean, can't take it out of context. You have taken by wicked hands of crucified and slain whom God had raised up having loosed the pains of death because it's not possible that he should be holding of it. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope because they will not leave my soul in hell. And that's not David talking about himself. It's David talking about the Lord. Neither will thou suffer the unholy one to seek corruption. Speaking of the fact that God would raise him from the dead. He wouldn't, and he, and it's stated, Matthew 16, that he would be, he rise again the third day. So third day is the day before corruption. Four days is corruption. So he, uh, his flesh should rest there for three days. Then the soul of the Lord would get back in the body by resurrection and go unto the father. My flesh shall rest in hope because thou will not leave my soul in hell. Neither will I suffer an unholy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known unto me the ways of life. That's the Lord. Thou shall make me full of, uh, of joy with thy countenance. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriot David, that he is both dead and buried and his sepulcher is with us into this day. And of course you can go over to Acts 13, and see that he saw corruption. Uh, David's body saw corruption, no doubt. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God has sworn with an oath unto him, uh, to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. Okay, now that would have been birth. That would have been the virgin birth. He would raise up Jesus from the woman, birth, and sit on the throne. But they rejected him and killed him. So, this uh, raising up Christ is explained in 31. Uh, I apologize. Yes, 31. He seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. And you can't miss that if you try. I don't care what anybody says. Verse 31 guarantees you that Jesus went to hell. His soul left his body and his body never went in the heart of the earth as Jesus said he would. His soul is down there behind the gates of hell, but it didn't hold him. And why people want to prove or try to prove that Jesus didn't go to hell, 
has something to do with a doctrine of a devil because the devil obviously knows why Jesus went to hell for you and I and for the people in the Old Testament. And he doesn't want anybody to believe that. Uh, he, he, does, he loves preaching hellfire and brimstone today because condemning people makes them afraid and they'll do anything they're told to do in religion. And, and you're told to walk the aisle or ask Jesus in the heart, turn from your sins, give your life to Christ, the whole nine yards. And the gospel that Paul speaks of is the gospel of peace. We do not have to worry about hell. We don't have to worry about death, which are two things in Revelation 20. We don't have to worry about them because Jesus has accomplished the victory over them. All right. And, and verse 31 is so obvious when people are arguing about this thing about hell. What kind of agenda do they have? I won't. Now, I mean, and don't take this wrong. I want my Lord to have gone to hell for me. I don't want to go to hell. I mean, that's scary. I mean, that's horrible. I mean, it's beyond comprehension to think that your soul would be in hell and then that land up in the lake of fire forever and ever. But I don't have to worry about that. I don't have to worry about that at all because Jesus has completed that death sequence of dying, going into hell, and then rising. He, he went through death. I mean, death is down there, and he went through it. And that's tremendous, and it's in Paul's writing. Now, verse uh, 32, this Jesus that God raised up wherever we all witnesses, all right? Now, something made this people want to kill him. Turn to John 18. I mean, why do you want to kill a person that heals, loves children, has nothing bad to say except about what you're doing wrong. He is a tremendous, absolutely beautiful human being in my eyes. I, I, no doubt when he walked, his presence was a tremendous blessing. Uh, but if you were wrong in your religion, he wasn't a blessing to you. And we'll just see some things that he said. In, in John 18, and people say, well, you shouldn't be cruel to religion. Then uh, there's something wrong with my Lord. He was. He was cruel to religion. He told them what they were doing wrong, on and on and on. But let's just look at some things. In John 18, verse 28, then uh, led they Jesus from Caiaphas under the hall of judgment, and it was early and they themselves went not into the judgment hall lest they should be defiled, but they should might eat the Passover. Pilate then went out unto them and said, what accusation bring ye against this man? They answered and said unto him, if he were a malefactor, were not a malefactor, we would have not delivered him up unto you. So they've got something in their mind. Malefactors are what they call the the men that hung on the cross, he hung between the malefactors. It's a, a criminal, a wrongdoer, or whatever. And if he weren't one of them, if he wasn't a malefactor, we wouldn't have delivered him. Then said Pilate unto them, take ye and judge him according to your law. The Jews therefore said unto him, it is not lawful for us to, to put any man to death. Hmm. What hypocrites. That's, that's like the hypocrisy of Judas. Judas takes 30 pieces of silver for to betray the Lord. Later on, the conscience hits him after things happen, and he takes it back to the same people that gave it to him and said, uh, I, I don't want this. And they said, we can't take that. That's blood money. You gave it. You gave the money. Now you're telling him you can't take it because it's blood money. And on and on. That is a hypocrisy of things. You know, I was talking about the Catholic Church the other night at Bible study at Panama, and I said, one of the people there, of course, is ex Catholic. And I said, you know, the Catholics let the mafia be part of the Catholic Church. Quite hypocrisy that is. They will gladly invite the mafia in if they pay money. And yet they teach, thou shalt not kill. 
That's hypocrisy. That's bribery. That's being bribed to accept someone into your religion. And that's that's exactly what preachers are doing. They're, they're being bribed or letting themselves be bribed on and on. Now look on with me in verse 30. Then they answered and said unto him, if he were not a malefactor, we would not have delivered him up unto thee. Then Pilate said unto them, take ye him, judge him according to your law. The Jews therefore said unto him, it is not lawful for us to put any man to death. Now, if you never thought about this, the Jews didn't kill him with their instrument. They gave him to the Gentiles to kill with their instrument. And the instrument was a tree. And God's purpose was in this. Uh, when Jesus was standing on a kind of a little cliff thing, which they don't have you know, at that point, they don't have much of a cliff. They were going to toss him off. And he turned and just walked through him because that was not the way he was going to die. They delivered him up. And of course, you read in Acts, delivered by the determinate council, delivered him up. They gave him to the Gentiles because their hypocrisy is we can't kill. But yet they said, crucify him. Well, that crucifixion is killing. So you do the dirty deed. That's what they wanted the Gentiles to do. But they've got to convince the Gentiles that he needs to be crucified. And Pilate's fighting them on this because he can't find anything wrong with Jesus. He, he, he looks at, he can't find anything wrong with him. And he said, you've got a law that you can let someone loose, but we'll read on and watch. And uh, verse 32, that this saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spake, signifying what death he should die. Well, what was that? He said he would be crucified and rise again the third day, Matthew 16, 21, from that time forth. So he signified in his statement to the apostles that he would be crucified. Okay. Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called Jesus and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus answered uh, him, saying, Thou this thing of thyself, I uh, apologize, sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell thee of me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priest have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of the world of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from thence. And his kingdom, obviously, will be the millennial kingdom of a thousand years. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a Jew then? Uh, art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born. Now watch, let's, see, let's read this again. Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born. For this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Pilate said unto him, what is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews and saith unto them, I find in him no fault at all. But you have a custom that I should release unto you one of the, at the Passover. Will you therefore that I release unto you the king of the Jews? Mm, see, he made them mad. Then cried they all again, saying, not this man, but Barabbas, but Barabbas. Now, Barabbas was a robber. Now, think about what, the transpiring, what's transpiring here is Pilate sees nothing wrong with it. He's the Gentile. He's, I, I'm not, am I a Jew? He sees nothing wrong to crucify this man. The Jews are delivering Jesus up to be crucified. So, because they don't want to be guilty of king, uh, a killing, okay? Uh, verse 31 it is not lawful for us to put any man to death. Huh? The Old Testament under the Levitical law, they could stone a man to death. They could do a lot of things. 
but the crucifixion is a different story. That was a Roman process and is a very evil, wicked thing, the way they did it. And crucifixion was a very horrible thing in that putting you on a rough tree and letting you basically suffocate unless they break your legs and on and on. I mean, it's a horrible death. It's a, it's a terrible death. And here these people want Jesus to have the Gentiles put him on that horrible tree. Crucify him, crucify him. We have no king but Caesar, they said. And you go, well, why did they want it? Why did they hate him so bad? Because if they would have went to him when he was walking his ministry, he would have healed them. If they would have believed him, they would have been with him in the kingdom. If they would have accepted him for who he was, they would be accepting God the Father. And no, they're not going to do this. Well, why? Well, because before, before the foundation of the world, God foreknew and foresaw us. And I look, and this is the way I look at it. You can look at it any way you want, you want, but I look at the Bible in the perspective of, thank God he saw me. I'm not worried about the Old Testament. I read that for comfort, patience, and, and, and things. I'm not worried about Hebrews through Revelation. It, it doesn't affect me. I read Romans through Philemon, and I say, thank you, God, that you looked at me before the foundation of the world, and all the processes of through the Bible work together for good for me. And I thank God for that. because. Number one, I could, uh, if things would have happened, the Jews wouldn't have repented, I would have been born. And they say, well, if you wouldn't have been born, you wouldn't know anything. That's right, I wouldn't know anything. And yet I've seen things in the world on, on the earth that are beautiful. I've seen things ugly. I've seen things horrible. I've seen things good. I have had a dance in this world for 72 years. But in that dance, I got to trust the Lord for eternal life. That means... For eternity, I am an adopted son of God. Now, why wouldn't I be grateful for that? Why wouldn't I be happy about that? I see mopey, down and out grace believers. What's wrong with you? Oh, yeah, the world's a tough place. Uh, the older you get, the tougher you got to get. It's a tough place. But this isn't home. We have something far greater to look at. And see, when you read over there in Acts chapter 2, Jesus looked at something far greater than the cross and hell. And how is that possible? Hell is, is horrible. How did he see something greater? He saw going back to the Father. Hebrews talks about he looked for the joy that was set before him. Well, what's set before us? We have eternal life. We never will see the wrath of God. We're not judged according to our sins. We're not judged to see whether we're in the book of life. We're in the book of life. And our attitude, why do we get so sour? Why do we get so upset? Why let the world get you? The world has nothing to do with you. It can't do anything. Jesus himself said, fear not him that can kill the body. Fear him that can kill the body, cast soul in hell. Fear the Lord. Fear the Lord how? I believe God is almighty. And I don't believe anybody can mess up anything that God says or does. It's established. I can go to bed at night and know the Bible don't change. I can get up in the morning and know the Bible don't change. I asked Jimmy and Jan last night at supper, I said, have you ever known me in all these years to change my mind about the Bible? No, except that it's gotten better. I mean, if we read it, it's not going to change. So we don't have to lie about it. It's just, just read it and go on and, uh, I hear these people say, I believe in following the book, the book, the book, and then they're off genre, off in some other direction, not believing the book. <clears throat> they say that to get people's opinion of them as good. You know, preachers will say a lot of things to get you to feel good about them. Well, I know you don't feel good about me. You know that I'm a liar because the Bible says there, let God be true and every a liar. You know that I like, I have an ego. And you know that I like vanity, I'm vanity and all that. That's a human being. But you also, I hope you know that I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe in his faith 
and not anybody else's. I trust in the Lord with all my heart. And believe not. On, I, I don't lean on in my own in, uh, my own understanding. I trust in the Lord. And it's better to put confidence in man than uh, trust. It's better to trust in the Lord and put confidence in man. Those are the things I believe. And I get up in the morning, the Bible hasn't changed. And if I don't read all day, it still didn't change. If I read it at night, it ain't going to change. But if I start reaching over there and trying to prove to you, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is for us, or Hebrews, the Revelation is for us, then I'm going to start lying. And why would you lie if you're in Christ? Paul said, I say the truth in Christ and lie not. So I take Paul's writings, and I know it's not a lie. And I take Paul's writings and rightly divide Paul's letters. And I understand that there are certain things in there I don't have to do. But let's get back to this in John. So he told him, you have a custom, you can let him go. They didn't want him. So they had a hatred for him that's amazing. Go back to Acts 2 and watch. I know about hatred. I, I know people that have been angry with me and a lot of them don't ever talk to me about it. And uh, I've had a few people leave this church over because they couldn't rule me or run me. Uh, when I moved here, I told them I'll preach what the Lord lays on my heart. I will not be conditioned by you, nor will I be blinded by your offerings or anything else because I don't see what money people put in. I don't ask. I have a treasure to take care of that. Not in my business what you give. I realize that in Bible studies, I can't control that you give it to me and i think i'm thankful for it but i'm still not going to be judged my preaching is not going to be judged by what you give uh you can't buy me and you can't buy my message but i love the fellowship and the friendship and if people appreciate what i preach and say so that's great but it's still i'm a human being i'm nobody else but a human being that's called by the lord i was saved and called with a holy calling and I believe that the foolishness of preaching is the power of God. And the power that is presented by that power is the gospel of Christ. And we're not going to get into that right now. But in Acts chapter 2, look at verse 23. Again, him being delivered by the determined counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken and by, now there's, here it is, wicked hands. Wicked hands have crucified and slain. Well, they didn't forcibly nail him. That was the Gentile did that, probably a, one of the soldiers. So their wicked hands is their thoughts and intents of their flesh are wicked in that they didn't want the Holy One. Uh, look with me in verse... Um, Chapter 3 of Acts, verse 14. But you denied the Holy One. The Holy One. Before them stood the Almighty Son of God. I think about when Jesus was in the house and the woman took and was crying and wiped her tears with her hair on his feet. And the other time, wiping the ointment, the expensive ointment. And Judas is upset because she's wasting. Wasting, he says, the ointment. And it's the feet of the Holy One. So <clears throat> God gives us time to live. And I believe people miss Ephesians 5 in this. I want you to go to Ephesians 5. I am so looking forward to, Lord willing, going up to visit Pete and Melody and, and the lake and, and all the brethren and all that. But that's my, not my sole intention. My, my intention is to go up there and teach. Uh, I have many Bible studies with people all the time. It, it's, that's what I do. That's what I live for. But, and, and it's not that I'm anybody special, but the Lord... Shows me things, and I'm so excited about it. I want to show it to you. And fellowship to me is, is wonderful. I look forward to it. I don't look forward to the drive. Don't get me wrong. 
that's all right. I look forward to going seeing David and Rhoda. I, I look forward to all that. I look forward to going to Mountain Home. People say, my God, that's 10 hours. You go to 10 hours of Bible class? I believe in that. And if I didn't go, if I didn't take the Bible study to them, I don't know if they would stick around. I'll just be honest with you. God intentionally led me to drive to Bible classes. And I have that ability. I, I don't know where it comes from. I'm 72 and I can still drive. Uh, I have no problem driving. I am going to have to have an eye operation uh, this year. Hopefully have cataracts removed. Um, lenses put in or whatever. But I just, I'm, I still have that ability. But it's the fellowship. But the main gist of it is teaching. We have fun while we teach. We have fun after we teach. And I don't, I don't have a problem with that. A lot of people are so uptight in their religion, they can't have fun in case somebody saw them having fun or whatever. Well, I don't believe in that. But here's something we are to think about in Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 6, Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things comes the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Now, you were a child of disobedience, according to Ephesians 2, 1, 2, and 3. But you're not now. You're an adopted child. All right? Now, verse 7. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. Partakers in what the children of disobedience do. So I have to discern by the word of God itself, what is it they're doing that is so bad? I mean, you take a religious person. They don't look like they're doing bad. I mean, they're, they're trying to live good in the community, trying to be nice to people on and on. But their doctrine is sour. Their doctrine's often left field. And they believe in water baptism. They believe in confession of sins. They believe in all. Well, that's just as bad as drinking and smoking and all the other things that people claim are the bad things. While you're better off smoking and drinking, running in a bar, than trying to promote yourself with your self-righteousness as the Pharisees. Now, let's read on. He said, for you were, see that word? Don't ever forget that word. You were sometimes darkness, but now you're the light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is all goodness, righteousness, and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. And of course, you can go to Romans 6, uh, 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through the end of the chapter and see all this. For it's a shame even to speak of those things which are done to them in secret. And of course, there are secret societies that everybody promotes because they do good in the community. But it's wrong and it's unfruitful. That in all. But all these things are reproved. But I apologize. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light for whatsoever does make manifest is light. Wherefore he said, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Then see, then you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Yeah, here it comes, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is, and be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, drunkenness, excess, but be ye filled with the Spirit. The Spirit wants you to read, wants you to study. Uh, there's a curious thing. Look with me in Thessalonians. First Thessalonians chapter 4. Now, you don't make people mad when you're friends with them or you have fellowship with them. And if you're having invited somewhere do you bring up the lord or do you talk about the lord or you just have fellowship with them friendship say that, uh, that's the key to it light walked into a dark room what did you do with the light did you turn it off till everything was done and then you walk back out turn it back on i mean see what i'm saying in first thessalonians chapter uh four he said uh verse 11 and that you study to be quiet and to do your own business and to work with your own hands as we command you. Study to learn to be quiet instead of griping and moaning. Uh, look at Philippians, what he said here in uh, 
Philippians chapter uh, four, Paul said, not that I speak in respect to want, for I've learned in whatsoever state that I am therewith to be content. Uh, look back in chapter uh, what I want to see is chapter 2, verse 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as you always have obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure, do all things without murmuring and disputing. Now, I don't mean anything by this, but I've, I've learned this through the years. And I, again, I'm nobody, but I represent a preacher. Let's say it that way. People are different around me than they are with their friends. Why would that be? Why would you be any different with somebody else than you are with me? If you talk a godly talk in front of me and talk about the Bible, why don't you do that with other people? I mean, what difference does it make? Say, well, I, I don't want you, Brother Jerry, to think something bad about me. Well, I already know you by the Bible. There's none righteous. There's none that do good. There's none that understand. There's none that uh, seek of God after God. Uh, I know that in the flesh dwells no good things. Uh, our righteousness are as filthy rags. I mean, it just goes on and on. That's what the Bible says about us. But you tell me you're a believer. Okay. Tremendous. Be a believer, not only in front of me, but everybody else too. Uh, say, well, Brother Jerry, you're not like most preachers. You're kind of a liberal in the sense that you don't mind drinking and you don't mind uh, jokes and all that stuff. I'm just who I am. If I'm somebody else with you than what I am, I'm a hypocrite. And it shouldn't be that way. God did not call me without knowing what I am. And Paul said, I know that in me that is in my flesh, but no good thing. I know that. Oh, wretched man that I am. And Paul said he tried to walk in perfection, Philippians 3, but he couldn't attain it, but he was already perfect in Christ. So do you redeem the time? Do you do things without murmuring and disputing? Do you do things without always being angry and puffed up or angry about something when you're supposed to be charitable? You're supposed to let the fruit of the Spirit work through you. You're to be kind, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Motivation. And, I mean, it just goes on and on. Well, if you do that, if you try to live that away, you will have the hatred of the world that hated Christ. Guarantee you. And you're accounted a sheep for the slaughter in the first place. But now let's go to Matthew 22. Matthew 22. And remember, in Acts 2, they had wicked hands delivered him. In Matthew 22, a lot of people talk a mean game, but they don't walk the walk. In Matthew 22, verse 15. Then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. Their motive around him is always to get him to trip, to say something wrong. So they say, I got you. Aha. But Jesus wasn't like them. He was a holy one. He was holy and without blame. There was no way they could accuse him except lie about him. And Pilate caught that. There's nothing wrong with this fellow. I mean, I talked to him and he has nothing to say that makes me want to condemn him. Pilate did not want to kill him. He did not want to condemn him. He wanted to let him go. And I think he was scared. Now watch. And uh, verse 16, Matthew twenty two sixteen, 16. And they sent out unto him their disciples, their disciples, you understand, their disciples, with Herodias, Herodias, saying, Master, we know that thou art true and teacheth the way of God in truth. Do you really believe that? I mean, come on, Pharisees, do you? And you, you're a disciple. Do you really believe that? 
No. What are they trying to do? Entangle him. For thou regardest not the person of men. Now, I want you to think about something. <laughs> I've had people, I've known people that when they ask you a question, it's not for you to answer. It's for them to show you how much they know. There are preachers that preach showing you what they know, not what they know. So that sounds kind of weird, Brother Jerry. No, there are things in this Bible I want you to know. I see them and it's so enlightening and it's so wonderful. And I get on there and I want you to know it. I don't care whether you know I know it. Again, I'm just a preacher. I'm not Superman. I'm not nobody. And uh, I'm going to bring you to a point here. I'm going to show you. I'm going to make you, I'm going to remind you of something. I love the brethren and I hope they love me. I had a conference here in Selma one time back a few years ago. And most of the Cleveland crew was here. And I believe uh, Dan preached. And I believe Steve did one and Freddie was here. And Freddie got up in the pulpit and started bragging on me. And I actually told him, I said, Freddie, just stop bragging on me. Whatever you learned from me, God gave me. I did not get it on my own. God blessed me with knowledge. And that knowledge is what I want you to know. I don't want you to know me. I am a bad man. I'm a, a vile bodied, living in an evil world, wretched individual. But I love the Lord's word. And I want you to know what the Lord wrote. And if you want to brag on me, that's your business. But don't make it a point that Freddie did to the point it was getting to, the, it scared me. Because that which is highly esteemed among men is the abomination of the Lord. And that wasn't the, the idea. I, I mean, he, he was grateful. But you know, I haven't seen him in two years now. What happened? If I was as good as the cotton gin, the invention of the cotton gin, what happened? Where are they at now? Don't you understand? There have been people that brag always, oh, Brother Jerry, I love you. I love you. And they're gone. Why? Why were they saying that? Why were they not believing it? Why do you say and believe not? If you love me, let it be sincere in the word of God. If you're charitable to me, be charitable in the word of God, but don't say and do not. But that's hypocrisy. And the hypocrites are the ones that killed the Lord as we look. But okay, now watch. Um, verse 17. And, and don't get me wrong. I love that you love me sometimes and you tell me so, or you appreciate your message. That, that's fine. I don't, that, that's not what I'm trying to prove to you. It's that lovey, mushy love that's fake. And what I preach to you, I want you to see it. Not because I know it, but because I, I know it. And it's been shown to me. And it's such a blessing when people do see things and it makes their life better. I pray that you get something in your life that helps you in scripture, that helps you in your life. Because this is a tough world to live in. But it's not home. Colossians chapter 3 is very clear on that. It's not home. Or set your affections on things above and on and on. All right, verse 17, Matthew 22, 17. Tell us, therefore... What thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar, unto Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived, oh my God, their wickedness and said, why tempt ye me, you hypocrites? Why would they tempt him with paying Caesar? 
Why would they tempt him with this? Why would they tempt? They have a hatred for him. Uh, turn to Matthew uh, 6. Now, if you go over here in Matthew 6, um, you know, there was something I did not read, and I apologize to you. In Matthew chapter 22, for, before, uh, where you were at, go back here, I apologize. I want you to read something else. In Matthew 22, again, verse 18, but Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, why tempt ye me? you hypocrites, okay? The hypocrites things, okay? Now let's look. In Matthew 6, 1, take heed that you do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. And he goes on, therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not send it, blow it, a sound of trumpet before the as the hypocrites do. So I, I've got a ruling here on what hypocrites do. In other words, this is going to be about hypocrites, and and I, I call the the uh, Matthew twenty three chapter the chapter of hypocrites, and it is. Uh, there, it's it's about hypocrites, and it's a really good chapter. We're going to go there in just a minute, but um, in verse um, four. Uh, yeah, three. When thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thou alms, thine alms may be in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites, here's what a hypocrite does, are, for they love to pray standing in synagogues and in the corners of the streets, for they, uh, for they may be seen of, of men. Verily I send you, they have their reward. But when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou shut thy door, pray to thy father, which is in secret. And thy father, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. And when you pray, use not vain repetition as the heathen do. So I've identified what heathen do. Heathen have vain repetition. They, they vain repeat. For they think that they shall be heard for much speaking. Now. I guarantee you that affects all of us on this Zoom today because we we're, we pray to God and then we're afraid we didn't get it over to him or wasn't thinking about it or wasn't listening. Uh, he already knew what she's going to pray. Your prayer is your relationship with the Lord. It helps you out praying to him, but he already heard. You don't have to do it again. You don't have to make assurance. The reason we do that is <clears throat> we are so insecure in our living daily that we repeat because we don't see God and we don't hear God. And we don't see Jesus. We don't hear Jesus. We don't touch him. And so we, we have to, it's like we walk by faith. We also have to pray by faith, but here's your prayer by faith. You have it written down in Paul's writings that he hears you. You have it written down that the spirit maketh intercession for you with groanings, which cannot be uttered. You have a right to cry, have a father, and on and on. And God's not going to be mad at you with your vain repetition. That is your nature as a heathen. But it's telling them not to be like the heathen. See, Israel had a specific, special calling. They were the children of God in the Old Testament. And he tells these disciples here what not to do also because they come in the program when Jesus comes on the earth, then the disciples come on the picture and he tells them, be not like the heathen. That's like in Matthew five, go not into the way of the Gentiles. Well, you can take that two different ways. Don't go in the way of the Gentiles or in the way that the Gentiles are. In other words, don't go that way. Um, trust what I say. In other words, uh, the Lord to them, he's telling them the words. Uh, they don't necessarily understand the words of John 17 until he reveals them unto him in Luke 24. Uh, upon resurrection, he, he opens their eyes of understanding to the words. And of course, when Peter preaches Acts 2, it's, it's the leadership of the Holy Ghost as they preach. And the words come to them. And I mean, it's totally amazing 
the leadership of the Holy Ghost as it is. But he said, he told them what to pray. Verse eight, be not therefore like unto them, the heathen, for your father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask him. Now, how can he know it? Well, he told them to sell out. So they know that he tells them to pray this. After this manner, therefore pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. And by the way, the, our Father goes over to Matthew 23 and reference. You can reference them back and forth and see this. It said, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. So they're asking for a kingdom to come. So it must going to be leaving. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Why? They don't have any. It's a prayer for something they need. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. They don't have any money. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also, uh, will also forgive you. Holy mackerel. That, you can't miss that. Forgiveness to get forgiveness. Ephesians chapter four, you forgive because you are forgiven. Totally different verses. Here they got to forgive to be forgiven. Ephesians chapter four, you forgive because you are forgiven. Motivation. Motivation here is to get forgiveness. Motivation in Ephesians is because you have forgiveness, a kindness. And verse 15, but if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. Colossians 2, having forgiven you all trespasses, it's already done. Thank God for Paul's message. That's all I can say. All right, now, look in verse five, uh, 20 of chapter 5, Matthew 5, verse 20. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. So their righteousness cannot be a hypocritical righteousness. It has to be a true righteousness, motivated, be righteous, kingdom. But it has to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees because they say and they do not on and on. Now go to uh, Luke 6. In Luke 6, in Luke chapter 6, verse 1, and it came to pass on the second Sabbath after the first that he went through the cornfields and his disciples plucked the ears of corn and did eat, rubbing them in their hands. And certain of the Pharisees, these characters show up all the time, don't they, in the scribes. Uh, why do you that which... Why do you that which is un, not lawful for you to do? I apologize. Why do you that which is not lawful to do on the Sabbath day? Jesus answering, said, uh, un, uh, answering them said, Have you not read so much as this, what David did when himself was a hunger and they which were with him? How he went into the house of God and did take and eat the showbread and Gave also to them that were with him, which is not lawful to eat, but for the priest alone. And he said unto them that the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. And it came to pass also on another Sabbath, they entered into the synagogue and taught. And there was a man whose right hand was withered. And the scribes and Pharisees watched whether he would heal on the Sabbath day, that they might find an accusation against him. You know, you think about this. You got a person that has a disease or an illness. And there's a man there that can heal him. And all you're concerned about is your Sabbath. A Sabbath was made for rest. But a Sabbath would not override the power of Jesus. Or God. And that's quite obvious is what you're reading there. Now I want you to turn to John 9. John 9. Verse 
The truth is the truth. But religion would rather override the truth with their tradition. You know, Paul said he was zealous of the traditions of his fathers, but he had to count all that but dumb. That's quite a thing, eh? You know, imagine going to church 50 years and you're coming pretty well to the end of your life. All of a sudden you realize something. You get in a book and the truth tells you it didn't mean a thing. Now what do you do? Well, it's a horrible thing. You lost 40, 50 years. People look at it wrong. No, trust the Lord and you get eternal life. The heck with what you did bad in the past. You know, people ought to quit looking at their past and enjoy their future. Christ died for our sins, according to scripture. He was buried and he rose again the third day, according to scripture. That's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. When you trust that, your past don't mean anything anymore. Say, well, God, if I just got it when I was younger, what would I do? You might have messed it up. When my dad got sick, he got cancer, he had lung cancer, and uh, he went downhill really quick. And he made himself go down quick. He quit drinking water. He knew that'd kill him. He didn't want to go to the hospital, so he wanted to die in his own bed. And I was at a Bible conference in Baton Rouge, and mom called me. She said, Dad's pretty sick. And uh, the, the, the doctor said that they could have him live another six months or so, but he's not doing it, and he's not doing good, and he's at home. I said, well, we'll drive up as soon as the conference is over. We'll come up straight up from Baton Rouge into Arkansas. I got there. My dad didn't weigh but about 100 pounds, a little over. He was just skin and bones. And <clears throat> he wouldn't drink water. So, I mean, he knew how to kill himself. I don't think he wanted to take a pill or anything. I don't think he, I think he wanted to see me and Kathy and the kids. But <clears throat> when I got there, I wanted to talk to him about the Lord. And he didn't want to talk. In that kind of condition, he didn't want to talk. That's, that's how bad religion had made him feel. My dad didn't go to church, but he liked religious music, but he would step foot in the church on Sunday morning. And I said, one time I asked him, I said, you like that religious music and all that? Why don't you go to church? And he said, uh-uh. I see him on Sunday morning. And I work with him on Mon uh, Monday. And right there, it hit me. They're one way on Sunday morning and they're another way on Monday morning. And it all has to do with money. It has to do with friendship. It has to do with relationship in the community. Your relationship in the community is good on Sunday because you went to church. Your relationship on Monday is that you act like them and you are like them and you treat them like that. And it's not about the Lord anymore. So you go six days, then on Sunday, they would declare the Sabbath, you know, which it ain't. And they go back to church, they change their clothes, change their face again. And my dad saw that because he worked with them on Monday through Friday. And he wouldn't step foot in there. You see how they caused the name of God to be blasphemed in my dad's eyes on that. And so I told him, I said, dad, it has nothing to do with you or I. It has to do with the fact that God's son died for our sins, was buried and rose again the third day. And I believe that my father trusted it because he died in peace. And in dying in peace, I told a story about it one time, and a woman, and I gave him morphine, and they said, oh my God, it's addictive. I said, well, aren't you stupid? I'd give, I'd give him all the morphine I could have found in the world if he needed it. And then another person told me, he said, you know, it ain't really right for a man to get saved on his deathbed. And I said, really? Why is that? He said, well, I mean, he lived his whole life the way he wanted to. And then all of a sudden, before he's dying, he gets the attitude and gets saved. I said, is it right for you to be saved now? For by grace are you saved through faith in that, not yourself, a gift to God, not a works, lest any man should boast. I thank God. Maybe my father closed his eyes and went to the Lord. And who cares what he did in his life? God don't care what you did in your life. 
He wants you to trust him, the truth. Accept the truth and he'll make you free. Free from death and hell and from wrath and for all the wickedness and the uh, children of disobedience, all of that. You become a child of God, sealed. And, and what if you get Alzheimer's? My sister has Alzheimer's. Is that coming from me? I don't know. But I don't have to worry about God forgetting me. He sealed me. How do I know? Because he said so. And God can't lie. Was it wrong for my dad to get saved on deathbed? No way. Till your last dying breath, it is not wrong. And I see people go visit their loved ones, and then they say, oh, well, he's dead. He, he went to a better place. Did he? Did you give him a chance to go somewhere to a better place by talking to him? Or were you afraid? And a lot of people like do funerals, and they're afraid as a believer to step against their siblings and let a funeral be preached of the grace of God instead of some mealy mouth John 14 or Acts 2.38 or uh, uh He's up there watching over us in his cabin in glory land and all that stuff. Why don't you stand up and be like a man and say, my father or my mother or my sister is going to have the word of God preached at their funeral. I've had a lot of people turn me down for unbelieving preachers simply because they're afraid to offend the rest of their family, their siblings with me. Why? Because of the truth. The truth is what people are afraid of. I get around people that I, that my friends know, and I talk to them about the Lord, and they had never heard it. Well, I thought they're friends. Why didn't they talk to them? Don't you see, folks? Don't talk the talk. Only walk the walk. You're the light. What do you expect your friends to keep going to church and get it? Don't you understand when Jesus came in the world, he didn't walk like everybody else. He walked in love of his father and he did the will of his father. Tempted all points like as we are yet knew no sin. And then he died for our sins and went into hell and came up alive and gave us his spirit, gave us his knowledge, gave us his mind. And we can prove what's acceptable will of God to people if we will. The God's world shut your mouth if you let him. But God will help you if you let him. In John chapter 9, this man is blind. Now, look with me in verse um, four. I must work the works of him that sent me. While it is day, the night cometh when no man can work. As long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. Oh, the light is in us. Second Corinthians chapter four, verse seven. And as long as we're in the world, we're the light. Now, you understand darkness don't like light. So darkness fights us. But we're the light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Proving to the world what God accepts. And on and on. Now he says in verse uh, verse 6. When he had thus spoken, he spit on the ground and made clay of the spittle. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And said unto him, go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way therefore and washed and came seeing and by the way if the guy don't go wash where god said what if he goes to his house and washes out of a pot i'm trying to get you to think about something you got to do it the way god says that's the way it works and if you don't do it the way god says it don't get done god never told you to get baptized in water god never told you to work God never told you to do anything. He said, trust the gospel of your salvation. Trust God to have sealed you. Trust God to have redeemed you. 
and trust God that he will redeem you in the day of redemption. Walk that away. Present to the fact the people around you that you're already forgiven. It has nothing to do with you getting forgiveness. Walk around with people telling you, you don't have to get reconciled. You are reconciled. On and on. That's how you walk. And you present that because you're the light in the world. That which dwelleth in you. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I live by the faith of Christ. That's how I live. Why wouldn't I give him the glory? I live because Jesus Christ had enough faith to die for me and be buried, go into hell and rise. That is incredible when you think about it. So he makes this man's uh, eyes be anointed and tells him where to go. If the man don't do what he says, it won't work. Say, how can that be possible? Because it's the way God said to do it. God tells us that we hear the word of our gospel, the, the, hear the gospel of our salvation. He didn't tell us we had to go do something. How, uh, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord should be saved. How shall they call him in whom they not believe? How shall they believe in him in whom they not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? How, be how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. I heard a man say the other day that he wasn't a preacher. He was just a talker. Well, then the people that are listening to him aren't getting anything. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching and the preaching of the cross is to them that uh, perish foolish, but unto us power of salvation. And that's not an exact quote. The gospel is our absolute joy. Somebody else died for my sins. If you don't get joy from that, there's something wrong with you. The great joy in my life is I will not die for my sins. I will not have to pay for my sins. And furthermore, the true joy, I don't have to die. I can go out alive. But if I go to sleep, I don't die in death. That's incredible. Why did they hate Jesus? What was the hatred for Jesus? Because he called them hypocrites. He called them fools and blind. Um, in Matthew 23, from 13 to 29, he called them hypocrites six times. He called them serpents in Matthew 23, 33. And on and on. The hatred for Jesus is summed up right here. Look at John 8. In John 8, 44, you're of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh of a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Now, the summation of why they hated Jesus is in verse 45. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Would you turn one last thing. Galatians chapter four. I've had people get mad at me and they really can't explain why they're mad at me and they leave and they never talk to me about it, why they left or anything. In Galatians chapter four, look with me in verse uh, nine. But now after that you have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to weak and beggarly elements whereunto you desire again to be in bondage. You observe days and months and times and years. I'm afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Brethren, I beseech you, be not as I am, for I am as you are. You have not injured me at all. You know how that through infirmity of the flesh, I preached the gospel unto you at the first. Remember what I was telling you about it. I'm a human being. And what I preach and what I teach was given to me of God. And it's not something I can brag about. 
It's not something I can glory in. I glory in the Lord because the mind of Christ can show us. I love that you would love me. And I love that you would help me. But I am nobody but a preacher. But you can mark me. If you believe I'm a good preacher, you can mark me that way. As long as I'm showing you Paul and the gospel and on and on. Now, verse 14. And my temptation, which was in my flesh, you despise not, nor rejected, but receive me as an angel of God, even as, Jesus, as Christ Jesus. Where is then this blessedness you spake of? See, I've had people talk about me and love me and all that and then leave. Now watch. Where is then this, the blessedness you spake of? For I bear you record that if it had been possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and had given them to me. And that's a clue of what was wrong with Paul. He must have had bad eyes because when he stoned him, he had a, it affected him. Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? The truth is not what the world wants. They want to be convinced that they're doing right. They're not. And your friends are not doing right if they're religious. Your friends are not right. You're the light. You're to deliver them the truth no matter what it costs you. Amen.